want to read just two passages of scripture and uh, so that we can really connect tonight with this principle of God's touch in our life. And I, I just, as I was thinking through uh, some scripture this afternoon and what God was putting on my heart, the first uh, scripture that came to my mind was in Matthew chapter 8 where uh, the leper comes to Jesus and obviously the leprosy in his life would make him unclean, uh, that he would have to live uh, separate as an outcast. And uh, I, I just, I thought about, I was actually working out and the impact of that, I just, I stopped and, and had to walk around outside for a minute because I realized how powerful it was several years ago when uh, Liz and I were in uh, India with uh, Rick Zachary and we were invited to go to a leper colony and minister and they'd started a church there because it was the only people that would allow the pastor and his wife to preach to him when he first got started and uh, you guys can come down if you want and I'll have you go right back up in a minute um, and in the in India they have a caste system and it's a it's really a, a tremendous barrier to the gospel because the lowest of the low are literally called untouchables. And I mean, that's, the, that's their status. They're not even considered people. They have no rights. Uh, but as our God can do, uh, he's touching the untouchables and the greatest movement and revival and move of God is among the untouchables. But the whole deal is everybody else considers them untouchable, but God doesn't, which is an awesome thing. But then the problem is not with the power of God. The problem then is with evangelism and breaking the barriers of a culture that have labeled people as untouchable. Thank God that none of us are untouchable, but all of us have been unclean. And so the interesting thing is when the leper comes to Jesus, he makes this proclamation, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. I just think it's interesting that he didn't say, if you're willing, you can heal me. He specifically said, you can make me clean. The power of shame in his life the enemy was using to keep him in a place where it, if, if he could just reconnect relationally with people where he expressed being clean rather than being healed. He didn't say, Lord, if you're willing, you can take this leprosy completely away. And God meets us where we are and touches us at the point of our need. And so Jesus didn't debate how he said what he said. He just responded to him. And he, I felt like that was our, that we put ourselves in that position tonight. And that if we're willing to say what the leper said, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. And the second stage to God healing uh, the depths of our shame is that Jesus stretched out his hand and touched the leper, and then he said, I am willing, be clean. He met him where he was. And so the, the healing of shame begins with us making that proclamation, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. At whatever stage we feel unclean, Jesus can meet us there. He can forgive us, he can cleanse us, he can heal us, he can restore us, he can establish us, he can meet us there. And if we'll make that confession and proclamation to him, then his response is, I am willing, be clean. And so what's the difference? The second step is we have to believe what Jesus said and take him at his word. See, we say, Lord, if you're willing, that's our statement of faith. The leper said, Lord, if you're willing. And Jesus said, reached out, touched him first. 
the connection with him in his uncleanness, which would have made Jesus unclean. And the leper had to proclaim, I'm unclean, I'm unclean, I'm unclean, and continually announce that to people so he wouldn't touch them and, and uh, make them unclean. And Jesus' response was to touch him and then say, I'm willing, be clean. And immediately, the leper was healed. Okay, Jesus touches him in that place and ministers to him. And I want us to put ourselves in that position. The other uh, verse of scripture that, or the passage that came, I referenced it earlier, is in Luke chapter seven, and where Jesus is in the home of Simon the Pharisee. And the custom was when you brought somebody into your home that you would at least offer them the a foot washing because of the, it was not only refreshing, but it was considered hospitality. And the Pharisee didn't do that. And another sign of honor and blessing when somebody came into your home was to anoint their head with oil. And he didn't do that. And so he was more trying to connect with Jesus out of curiosity and kind of feel him out. And there was some suspicion and, and some interplay. And so a woman who was not invited to the dinner, but when a rabbi came into someone's home and other people heard about it, they could come not for the meal, but to hear the teaching and to what the rabbi had to say. And they would sit back uh, uh, in a corner or in a uh, obscure place and they would they could listen in on the conversation they, they weren't an honored guest but they could be in the home and so the woman hadn't violated any protocol except for the fact that she had a reputation and the the scripture calls her a sinful woman or a disgraceful woman and she didn't just keep her place so to speak she didn't stay on the boundaries that she came up behind Jesus as he was reclining at this table and she began to weep and she, her tears fell on his feet and then she bent down and began to wipe them with her hair. And then she took the most priceless thing she had, this bottle of perfume and broke it in poured it on his feet and continued just to weep and to anoint his feet and, and then bend down and kiss his feet over and over and over again in her weeping. And the Pharisee was in an awkward position and so he thought to himself if Jesus knew what kind of woman this was, that, that you know, obviously he's not a prophet or he would have known that. But not only was he a prophet, he was a great prophet because he knew what Simon was thinking, even though he didn't say it. And he knew what the woman needed to hear, but would have been very uncomfortable for him to address her directly. So I want you to watch as we read through this passage, just a few verses here. Luke chapter seven, beginning in verse 36 is the account. It says, when one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who had lived a sinful life. So it wasn't a mistake. It wasn't an error. It wasn't a bad judgment call. It was a consistent lifestyle of bad behavior. Okay? Getting... Uh, legitimate needs met through illegitimate means. It was a lifestyle. It was a pattern. A woman who had lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, so she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him, weeping at his feet, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured the perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is. 
what kind of woman she is, what kind. When we disconnect from genuinely loving people, we begin to label them. What kind of person is this? What kind of friend am I going to let this person be? What kind of neighbor are they? What, what kind of? And it begins to be this distance that we create and the way that we objectify people and label them and put them in categories because it's easier for us to deal with the awkwardness of interchange and relationship. He would have known what kind of woman this is and who is touching him. Jesus answered him, Simon, notice that Jesus didn't, the, Simon didn't ask Jesus the question he thought to himself. So, so he didn't ask him anything, but verse 40 says, Jesus answered him. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. The one owed him 500 denarii and the other only owed him 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back. So he forgave the debts of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose, don't we answer the Lord like that? I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly. Jesus said, watch this. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon. He's not talking to the woman. He's still talking to Simon. But now he's repositioned himself and he's making eye contact with this woman who's behind him, weeping and wiping his feet and kissing them and wiping this perfume on them. Powerful position. Do you see this woman? Now he's talking, he's looking at the woman, but he's talking to Simon. Get, get the picture. He's engaging them both, but he's, he's t- taking his eye contact away from Simon and putting it on this woman who really doesn't want it. If she did, she would have come in front of him instead of behind him, okay? She's still risking being exposed, but she's dealing with the shame through worship. A disgraceful, sinful woman who's not yet forgiven but it's willing to take the risk. Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman has not stopped kissing me, my feet from the time I entered. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little loves little. Now, the point Jesus was making wasn't that the woman got forgiven because she loved The point he was making is she loved because she'd been forgiven. Okay? Then Jesus said to her. All this time he's talking to Simon. He's just not looking at him anymore. He's looking at the woman saying, do you see this woman? He didn't say, do you see what kind of woman this is? Or I am a prophet and I see what kind of woman this is. Now he's put the emphasis on what she's done, not what she is. Shame always keeps the emphasis on what you are rather than what you do. 
and you can't do enough good, noble, honorable things to break shame because it's still objectified in your life. It's a what. And Jesus doesn't deal with our what. He deals with our who. He wants to know us. And he wants us to know that he knows us. He knew Simon. And so he addressed him directly, but in an indirect way without making the eye contact because it would have been harsh and almost insulting to Simon. But when he put the emphasis on this woman and the awkward situation, but was still addressing Simon, they could both receive it. She was hearing what he was saying about her that opened her heart to where then he could speak directly to her and she could receive it. Kindness leads us to repentance. And so Jesus is speaking about her kindness where no one else would put that in the category of labels of of her life. She's a kind woman, but man, she's messed up. The kind, it wasn't kindness. The kind was a label of this unholy woman touching this guy who claims to be this holy prophet. So then Jesus puts and addresses her directly and says to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Your faith has saved you. It's the Greek word sozo. And then he says, go in peace. It's the Hebrew word shalom. So he meets her where she is and meets her needs in a powerful way. Let me just give you the, the extended definition for the Greek word sozo. Your faith has saved you. Sozo means to save to heal, to cure, to preserve, to keep safe and sound, to rescue from danger or destruction, to deliver. In primitive cultures, it translates simply to give complete new life. Your faith has sozoed you. It has given you a complete new life. What kind of life had she lived in that town? A sinful life. And Jesus now says, your faith has given you a sozo life. The other uh, uh, definition for that is to cause to have a complete new heart. Sozo. Your faith has saved you. Therefore, go in peace. Peace was the last thing that she had in her life. Who knows how she got into the house and hearing and and what she came to. But even in the midst of her sinfulness, her disgracefulness and her shame, she expressed extravagant worship and love in a very awkward way. Not so much for her, or Jesus, but for everybody else. Her worship is what connected her with the Lord. It's what opened the avenue for the shame to be broken, for the peace and the healing, the salvation, the sozo of God to come. And I believe that as we really see how powerful it is, when, when, when you read through scripture, particularly the New Testament, and you read through the accounts of healing, it's seldom just the condition that is healed. That Jesus does so much more in ministering with dignity, in touching people who had been separated from human touch, like the leper, 
the untouchables, that he would touch them. And then he would speak to them, to the, to the woman who probably seldom heard kind words. He spoke kindly. That he would speak about her in her presence to break the power of those who had spoken about her behind her back. And the object of their gossip now became the focus of his example, but it was in healing love and embrace. That that he opened this avenue into her heart and life. Not only did she touch him, but then he touched her. The power of that touch is incredible in our lives. Can you say amen? I want you guys, if you would, come back. And I want us just to take this time and um, let the Lord not only minister to us and touch us and us connect and touch him, but I want to have a time where we can just spend that time in prayer and minister to one another. Can we do that? More, More than just a thing at the end to kind of close but to really allow the spirit and the presence of the Lord to do the deep work in our life that he needs to do and anoint and use us as a body as we come into community as we follow the example of the Lord Jesus and like this woman that loved much because she was forgiven much how many of us don't have to think back too far to to not only the first time we were forgiven and the love that our hearts opened up, but the latest time we we were forgiven. And it's just as powerful that that when we say that the Lord never changes, that he's the same, but he's never boring. The, The consistency of that and the stability in our life draws us back again and again and again. Jesus didn't come to help religious people He came to seek and save the lost. He did come to the lost sheep of Israel and he did minister life to religious people. It's that they had so many more barriers to get past than broken people who just knew they were messed up. And when we can come with that level of humility, even in the midst of shame and disgrace in our life and the brokenness and bring it to Jesus instead of trying to hide it from him, I mean, most of us can imagine that woman if she came into a a, a church, regardless, probably even ours, that, that there would be this nervousness and anxiety and she'd be trying to do the best she could with what she had and, you know, wiping her face down or making sure her hair wasn't real nasty and, you know, straightening stuff and, but it would have been very self conscious. That's why she was standing behind Jesus. What Jesus wants to do is meet us face to face. What Jesus wants to do is let us hear his voice speaking about us. But the more powerful thing is when he speaks to us. When he takes his word and he puts it in our heart and he applies it as a healing balm in the places of our heart that are unclean leprous, diseased, infected, unpresentable. And when we have the courage to do that and we respond in love, not in self-righteousness, but in that sense of approaching him and, and just being there, sitting at his feet, touching that part of Jesus that their culture would have said was unclean. Maybe she started there because that's what she felt like she deserved. Or maybe she understood that I'm gonna do the best I can and if the only glory I have is my hair, that, that I'm gonna use my glory to touch him. That, that if the only gift I can bring is maybe the only resource I have of value, it's not a waste. It becomes worship. 
Father, I just pray that you would touch us here tonight, all of us. Thank you for how incredible that it is that you came and made yourself touchable. Beyond that, you identified with us and became what we are. Yet holy and distinct as a prophet and a priest and a king. You were a son and a stepbrother. You were a friend and a teacher. Father, beyond the labels and us putting you in categories, you use the authority and the anointing at every level of your calling and your title to not only touch us with the power of God and to bring heaven to earth and release it to us, establish your kingdom as the king, but to declare the word of the Lord and as the priest, take the sin upon you and become the sacrifice. So Lord, I pray that every area of our heart tonight just be open to you. That as we come, Father, as we connect with you here in a moment of worship, then an extended time just a prayer and ministry tonight. God, I pray that you would anoint us as a kingdom of priests. Pray that you would anoint us as we lay our hands on one another, as we pray for those needs and minister the life of the word to one another through the power of prayer, power of the touch of God through hearts that are open to you, vessels of honor because we're cleansed. God, we thank you for it. We give you praise. I want you to sit there for just a minute. If you guys would just minister for a moment, just create an atmosphere of worship. Then I'm gonna invite us following that time just to get in some small groups, just allow that time of extended ministry and prayer one to another tonight. How about that? Let's just take some time, minister to the Lord, let him minister to us here for a moment, and then we'll spend the remainder of that time just praying and ministering one to another. I 
word, just a prophetic prayer, just being led by the Lord. Just go ahead and stand where you are, would you? It's not singling ourselves out or in an awkward way. It's just positioning ourselves there to receive. Amen. Back here, Miss Ola, up in front. Go ahead and stand. Don't be shy. Come on, it's an awesome thing to receive from God. Amen. Bill, as well. Hallelujah. Now, with several of you just gather around, right back here, amen. If there's someone around you standing, Danny, were you standing for prayer or positioning yourself to minister? Both, hallelujah. Sowing and reaping, amen. Doesn't have to be rushed, doesn't have to be hurried. Listen, just ask the Lord. And then just respond and release what God's speaking into your heart. Maybe a word of scripture. It may be a word picture. It may be a specific word of prophecy that you speak over their life. Maybe a word of wisdom, a word of knowledge that God gives you. Let's just take some time right here in the anointing to pray and minister to one another.
do I could search for all eternity long And find there is none like you
everybody, would you just take a minute? If you're not praying for someone or receiving prayer right now, uh, would you just find some somebody else? And, you know, prayer is not only praying for something specifically or even praying in an agreement with somebody as they express a need. Prayer is just praying a blessing over somebody's life. Amen. So let's bless one another tonight in prayer before we go praying one for another. If you would just huddle up, form a, a group there. Thank God for what he's done. Pray prayers of blessing over somebody's life. Just encourage them in the Lord. Hallelujah.